Thank you, Bruce. This is a bit of a somber note you introduced into this conversation. <laughs> I uh, have to say that at this stage of uh, what we know about science and a dozen or so National Academies of Science having opined on the issue, it's uh, impossible to take seriously, I think, a candidate for president who doesn't acknowledge it, uh, aside from the preposterous proposal to eliminate EPA. That's right up there with eliminating the IRS. Actually, it's worse. <laughs> I uh, want to commend David Hayes for organizing this and for the very uh, significant participation by people who really know these subjects. Coming at the end of the day, it would be, uh, I think, quite sufficient for me to try to compile a quick, succinct summary of what has been said, because much of it I agree with and um, really uh, very significantly agree with support. I, um, I want to say something at the beginning about a report that has just been released this week by the Energy Transmission Commission, something I think was commissioned by the Secretary General of the United Nations, particularly um, on the consequences and importance and the specific consequences of the Paris Agreements. They extracted from the various commitments that have been made five significant points. The first of which is a very, is a very encouraging one. There can be expected to be a massive expansion of renewable energy in the developing countries over the coming years, reaching up to, and the report talks about the period until 2030. And there will be some $2 trillion needed to support that, uh, that construction, that implementation. Much less is said about the sources of that money in the commitments that have been made by the various countries, most notably uh, China, which has committed 500 gigawatts of solar and 400 gigawatts of wind by 2030. But one has to hope and expect that that capital will be available. To a very large degree, the commitments made in Paris were contingent on the availability of capital from international institutions and private investors. Second, there is also a concomitant and very significant growth in coal-fired power, some 1,600 terawatt hours, 480 in the developed countries, which cancels out many of the gains in the developed world on reducing <coughs> carbon dioxide. Third, there are very limited measures to decarbonize energy supply beyond the power sector, which counts for about a third of emissions in the United States as well as in the rest of the world. Um, buildings, transport, and agriculture are not included in any measurable way in the commitments that have been made by most of the countries. And I was pleased to hear David Hayes talk about land use as one of the very important sinks and the uses of land is exceedingly important to achievement of carbon reduction. I have noted the um, Consumer Goods Council's commitments to deforestation and to preventing deforestation of virgin forest throughout the world, and note also that those include the um, people who trade in something like 13 of the major commodities and have a capacity to have a very significant influence on addressing that problem, including the Indonesian fires that, that David mentioned. Those will need more support from the next administration than they have had from this one. Um, no one has opposed, actually. We have agreed to those commitments and for the United States to be part of it, but it has not accelerated, it has not influenced, I think, generated as much uh, progress as it might have. I have uh, overseen climate smart food security for President Obama's Global Development Council. That's a nine member group that's looking at foreign assistance priorities, <coughs> development uh, aid and the like. And um, as I contemplate the situation of climate change, I'm reminded how many goals, very pressing and important ones, are in competition with the climate goal. And some of which, which are right directly on point may in fact distract from addressing the problem. I woke this morning to read the Financial Times report that the largest dam in India, which generates and is designed to generate and has generated 1,000 megawatts of power, 
is dead in the water. Actually, not in the water. There's no water behind it anymore. One of the largest reservoirs in India. And all over India, trains are taking water to villages that have none, and so are tank trucks. That, whether that is understood to be just a secular uh, situation, the consequence of two failed monsoons, or whether it's seen as a harbinger of climate change and propels more energy on the climate issue, remains to be seen. But it's not obvious that it will, though all of us here would hope that it would. One-fifth of total emissions reductions committed in Paris depend upon international financial support and technology transfer to seven developing countries. And in many cases, the commitments are explicitly contingent on receiving those kinds of funds. In the United States, the very ambitious commitments we have made, in fact, uh, do not get us to the reductions that have been promised, that were promised in Paris. We have good intentions, just like other countries, but a third of the policies necessary to get the emissions third of the policies necessary to get a third of those admissions have not been characterized. They've not been made specific. And that leads me to comment on the, on the nature of the commitments that were made in Paris. In the councils of the parties that uh, I was most familiar with over the past several years, invariably the most controversial and newsworthy part was the degree to which countries did or did not support or oppose targets, and timetables. Those beginning in Rio got the play, and the United States government was heavily criticized for not committing to them. Well, what was done that, as my view, has made this Paris Conference of the Parties successful is basically a surrender on that issue, a willingness to accept countries' own programs, the best that they could do, what they came to the party with, and say, you're in the family, you're in the club, we applaud you and we'll move on. I support that. I think that was a wise, prudential uh, decision on the part of the organizers of the Conference of the Parties. But it leaves us without much that you can really take to the bank. The future of the commitments that have been made will be determined uh, more, I hope, by the first five-year Review. I guess it's, in, it's, more, it's earlier than five years, but um, it remains to be seen how specific they, they will be. The first obligation, I think, of those who are involved with this is going to be to take the commitments apart, get common baselines agreed to, to the extent countries will agree to that, common definitions, sectoral understandings, and much more specific uh, commitments to report, to monitor, and to reveal to the public where we are, where they are on climate, uh, carbon dioxide reductions. Well, the kinds of things that, that they're going to have to do suggest a structure of organization that particularly in developing countries, those of us who had experience with them, um, have to recognize will, will require a great deal of assistance and advice. The organization of government, the setting of the clim climate priority, the kinds of tax systems and incentives, the care with which corruption is dealt with and prevented in terms of the large-scale adaptation expenditures and infrastructure construction that occurs, particularly in the energy field. All of those will need tremendously close attention. And the logical place to set the example, I think, and to uh, really draw on a very successful program of assistance in development in the last 20 or so years is the United States. Our own aid agencies, our own government monitoring and support. That speaks to the issue of leadership. I completely agree with John Podesta that had the United States and China not made the decisions that they made, the commitments that they made before Paris, Paris would not have come to pass and would not have been the success that it was. I, was, uh, I visited the climate negotiator for China in Beijing a few weeks before Paris, and the first question he asked me was, what is the likelihood that the commitments made by President Obama will survive his administration? It is very important to the Chinese that they do. 
It is very important, I think, to the rest of the world that they do. It has never been clear that the United States, its example, its success, the fact that we have the clean power rule and we have the automobile fuel efficiency standard of 54 and a half miles per gallon, which by the way is estimated to result in more than two million barrels a day of reductions in oil use in the United States. These are profoundly important to maintaining the progress toward addressing the climate challenge. I uh, think that there has never before been more urgency for a U.S. president to mobilize our country, to provide the leadership to the world, for the private sector also to engage. With respect to one of uh, the presentations made, it occurred to me that uh, the loan guarantee program might have been better protected, if not more successful, if the advice that some of us gave to the uh, Office of Management and Budget and the Energy Department to allow private equity to supplant, or rather to, to um, support and increase the amount of loan guarantees that were made. Our argument was, let those of us who do this for a living uh, put a billion dollars next to two billion dollars of federal money and share the risk and share the profits on what, ha what happens and what, what results. I think if the private sector were more actively engaged, and I really applaud the fact that OPIC and some of the financing tools that in the past have not been as flexible and free, merging equity and debt, for example, in the support of um, projects and, uh, and companies in other countries, in developing countries, those have been opened up in this administration, and uh, the recommendations of the Global Development Council are to open them up more. Well, we um, have to we have to hope that our country will maintain its course. We are, as I said to the Chinese negotiator, <coughs> decarbonizing as a country. That's happening. We're going to meet the goals that President Obama set for the United States in Copenhagen. They're not enough to take us to the goals that were set in Paris, but they are, as we used to say uh, at EPA, when we couldn't quite claim full credit yet, uh, directionally correct. We are headed in the right direction, and we have to hope and invest so much in making sure that the next president is committed to slaying the dragons of, of climate destabilization, which have been unleashed upon the earth and the waters. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try an experiment. First, um, for those of you who know me, there will be no PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to talk from my seat, and I have a watch in front of me, so I'm going to stop in 10 minutes. So um, a, a few comments in general. Uh, you're going to forgive me, I'm straight a little bit off script. From, from, but um, with regard to climate change and the science about it, things of that nature, it is indeed settled that the climate is changing. It's largely caused by humans. Beyond that, it's not settled. Let me give you one example. It's only in the last five years that we're discovering that uh, there may be a solution to a long-standing dilemma. What was the dilemma? 120,000 years ago, the last warm period, uh, we were about one degree hotter than we are today. The fossil record shows the sea level was Guess how much higher than today? I will, it's a quiz, I'm a professor, but uh, we don't have time for grading, so I'll tell you the answer. It's six to nine meters higher. Six to nine meters, not centimeters, meters higher. Only one degree hotter, which was the Paris goal. The dilemma was, well, our common models weren't actually telling us this. Our glacier models weren't actually telling us this. So what's going on? History was telling us this. And history, in this sense, is, I think, a better predictor than where we are today in, in the climate world. And it's only in the last five years that we're beginning to see, number one, satellite measurements are saying, oops, we got that wrong. The glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica, the glaciers in Antarctica 10 years ago were expected to be actually increasing, but they're decreasing. And some of them are decreasing at a rate that is astounding, kilometer per year glacial runoff in Western Antarctic. Not a centimeter, 10 centimeters per year. And so this is recent satellite data, recent measurements, only in the last couple of years. The, the, the climate community is still digesting this. 
let alone the public. So when I hear people say, let's decide what to do, and then, and then after that we can decide what, well, we're not even deciding now where we're heading. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is gonna need constant evaluation. When I was Secretary of Energy, uh, EPA saw this also, NASA saw this, NOAA saw this. Constant efforts to defund anything that had to do with climate measurement. Another uh, fact. Okay, so um, in terms of things of where we want to go, there's another thing that I should tell people. This is good news. Um, clean energy is actually getting much cheaper than even I as a perennial technical optimist thought was going to be. It's hard to, in the United States, to disentangle the production tax rate from wind, which is now about two, two and a half cents a kilowatt hour in contracts, but, but we have a production tax rate. We have an investment tax rate of solar, 30%. It's hard to disentangle that. So I look to the south. Mexico has first energy auctions. Uh, it's the new change of the Constitution. It was no longer a government monopoly. And so people, investors can come in and they say, we can put up a wind farm, we can put up a solar farm. You pay us a certain rate, the all profit included, we'll sell you electricity at a certain cost. The cost was about four cents a kilowatt hour without the mandates in both solar and wind. Four to four and a half cents a kilowatt hour, no production tax credit, no investment tax credit, no renewable portfolio standard. It's just money, including profit. This is pretty good news. And this is the best way to actually back out what the subsidies are. What, is the other, what are other economies close by with great wind, great solar, the way we have? So that's also good news, but there's a lot of misinformation being played out as how it's really more expensive than that. So, so there's a lot of things um, that can be done. Now, I am going to return to script a little bit uh, uh, and what the agencies can do. But one more slight correction about what's been said. We saw a graph where uh, the former head of the CEQ showed uh, uh, a graph of you start with federal research, it's, uh, uh, federally support research, you walk down, you get investment opportunities and invest in VCs and it goes up the ladder. Except that's generally true, but I want to make one small correction. Uh, if you pick a technology, any technology, it implies that there's a time where research actually appropriately sunsets, it, all the research is being done, it's done. Uh, and that is simply not true. When I see people, uh, for example, uh, they talk about carbon capture, they have assumptions there, we can capture carbon at a certain price, a certain parasitic load, 25%, I'm quoting from memory the slide I saw. Uh, certain costs, things of that nature. Actually, number one, without carbon capture, we are going into, the technical physics word is deep doo-doo. <laughs> um, because it's not only carbon capture from coal, but it's carbon capture from every point emitting source, cement, steel, coal, natural gas, oil refining, you name it. Uh, you've got to capture the carbon. The price is not there yet. And, oh, by the way, even if it may be acceptable to certain segments of the world population, it's, if it's not acceptable to India and China, it's not going to work. And so I think there's a great deal of research that can be done. There's great opportunities scientifically, but the things we're piloting today are not going to make it. And so I think the emphasis on keeping alive the research uh, to actually drive down the costs. Batteries, another great example, electric vehicles. You know, we have the Tesla, great shiny example. The Tesla Model 3, start, starting at 35,000, really it's gonna start about 45,000 for the first couple of years of cars they sell. Uh, but, it, but when it gets to 20, 25,000, then it becomes mass market and it's not even gonna be a debate anymore. You need a new generation of batteries. Not the ones that Gigafactory is going to build, but a new generation of different chemistry batteries. The probability of that happening, who can say, but I would guess within a decade we will have that, which means another four or five years of safety testing. Uh, so, so the role of research uh, is incredibly vital to continue to drive down the cost to make clean energy 
the low-cost option and make it further the low-cost option because it actually has to overcome the built-in infrastructure and inertia that we have. So it's not a matter of reaching cost parity, it's also a matter of overcoming the inertia with uh, such strong economic incentives uh, without subsidy, where I think it's going to really win the day. Now, regarding what uh, the topic of this conversation, cabinet agencies and, what, and what, how can they help, there are many, many government cabinet agencies that overlap in the question of uh, in the environment, climate, energy. Um, and that is part of the issue that no one, there's no single ownership. There's EPA, there's DOE, there's uh, interior, there's agriculture, and there are agencies like NASA and NSF. Um, we have in our system of government checks and balances. But since we have so many agencies that overlap this, one thing I learned in Washington is, again, as a physicist, you look for generally applicable rules, a few things. Unless continually pushed, things come to a halt. Newton was wrong, Archimedes was right. The friction in government is immense. You get more friction if there are more agencies involved. Do you have super agencies? Uh, there was an attempt with President Obama with uh, Carol Barner's office. Uh, to try to do something like that. There was CEQ, which is another attempt to try to do anything. But in the end, the agencies with the budgets actually have a voice. And if you can't bring the agencies with the big budgets along, having um, a convener within the White House doesn't work as well. Now, I personally think my advice to the next president would be, depending on who becomes in the cabinet in these agencies, you say, okay, this cabinet member takes the lead on this period, end of story. Talk about uh, transmission lines, uh, many agencies, Interior, uh, FERC, Department of Energy. No one was taking the lead. Uh, there was meetings, half a dozen meetings at CEQ. Finally, Ken Salazar, who was directly uh, very much along similar lines, wanting to do something, he says, I remember there was a law passed when I was a senator that says if the Department of Energy wants the authority to side transmission lines, uh, they can have it. And I said in the meeting, okay, I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> and then an hour later, just kidding, because Fish and Wildlife put so much pressure, they said, no, 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 no. We, you know, even within Interior, there were conflicting agencies. Fish and Wildlife don't want any transmission lines anywhere near their jurisdiction, whereas other parts of Interior wanted them. And so again, I think, and uh, another story, NIST. NIST um, and Department of Energy says, we want to get interoperability standards for smart grid transmission distribution, just so things could talk to each other. Just, just the communication standards. We had a forum, a workshop. We wanted to throw the people in the room, the major players, uh, throw them pizza or whatever they wanted, salad or whatever, and, and, until they came up with uh, standards. Uh, because if the government came up with standards, it would take five years. Of, of all the, you know, the to and froing in the government regulations, uh, we couldn't get that done. It, we, there was an attempt to do that. And so again, I think the president actually has incredible power. I will end by saying that how I was so impressed when I saw this movie Lincoln, it might not be true at all, <laughs> but what, where Abraham Lincoln says, the president is cloaked in immense authority. And the president actually can do a lot in order to get the agencies to play. The president working with Congress, if it's going to be a, a Abraham Lincoln or Lyndon Johnson, good. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let's have the president do that. Congress has to step up to the plate and realize that uh, there is all this information out there. You talk about adaptation, and one final comment, and I'm one minute over, but... Um, one final comment is something um, that I just heard in the last panel. Um, the government has lots of information. The, getting that information out, and in particular, the cost of adaptation, the cost of fighting extended fires and fire seasons, the cost of flood control, the cost of cop failures. The federal act, government, actually, we're working with the states, can actually gather that information, just post it. And these costs are really hidden from the American public. You know, we're, we were hemorrhaging every time there's a Katrina or Sandy, we're $23, 25000000000 billion in debt from flood insurance. 
another big one, we just ratchet up another one. And so these are costs that are part of adaptation and that will help us appreciate how do you going to do the adaptation and the mitigation? Because it's something that, in the end, not only the American taxpayers, but the world will pay for. Let me just take a political scientist's prerogative to remind the audience of a couple things. First of all, while it, the odds are very high that uh, Clinton will win the election, I would say as a political scientist, it's not going to be as easy as it looks. Uh, and so, <laughs> Uh, it, uh, it will, there are some real problems with this election going forward. But at any rate, it is interesting. We haven't talked much about Trump and his policies. I should note three things. First of all, uh, Donald Trump has said he will abolish the EPA if he gets elected. Uh, secondly, he's going to revoke all of the executive actions and orders that uh, President Clinton has taken. And thirdly, he reserves the right to change his mind. So I'm not sure how you would organize for uh, President Trump. Fortunately, uh, that, that's not the odds-on likely outcome. Do you comment so on this? You, you raised the question of organization of government, and I realized I promised David Hayes that uh, <laughs> I would address the paper that his students, probably some of whom are here, wrote uh, that I read. A very good paper on some successes and some failures of organization of the government. And what occurred to me, looking back at history, was the very successful experience the Nixon administration had in organizing the program of the environment that gave us the Clean Air Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Water Act, toxic substances, a whole spate of such things done in, in close collaboration with the Congress, a Democratic Senate and House. And what Nixon did was he used the Council on Environmental Quality, which uh, Jim Connaughton ran in the uh, G.W. Bush administration, he chose a heavyweight, Russell Train, to run it, and he gave the council two authorities. One, actually, the statute gave them, and that was the Environmental Impact State Assessment. At the time, it was new, and it scared the daylights out of agencies, and as CEQ wrote the regulations, the guidance, I wrote the first set of guidance, guidelines with my, my boss for that, uh, they were quite terrified. But it, it concentrated the review authority, the receipt authority, in one place. So that gave some ability to comment and shape projects. He then gave to it the responsibility to write his legislative program. Well, if you were the energy secretary, you wanted to be nice to the CEQ chairman because you didn't know what kind of legislation, and we were touching on all sorts of things. One of the things I was asked to do in my first week in the place was identify projects for cancellation of the Corps of Engineers. And we, we found $500 million worth of projects, including the cross border of Large Canal, which never got built as a result. But what I look back at was, first of all, the president had written on his yellow pad 14 issues. He drew a line <coughs> under four. And he said, on these top four issues, I want to be involved personally in everything that happens in the administration. The next 10, he said, I want us to be forward leaning. Don't bother me. Don't include me unless you really find that that's necessary. The environment, I understand, was um, among that 10. But he managed to take a number of priorities, give sufficient authority, delegation, to some quite good people, John Ehrlichman, John Whitaker, uh, Russell Train, Bill Ruckelshaus, with whom, by the way, I've just co-signed a brief supporting the clean power rule in the Court in, uh, of Appeals in, uh, in Washington. Uh, I think that that model and we've not seen a Council on Environmental Quality used to that degree since, <coughs> and it requires a very special person to be the chairperson, someone who really does have the confidence of the White House staff and of the president. Not impossible to get such a person. One could imagine John Podesta playing that role. He could do it from the White House as well. I think, frankly, given that the Council on Environmental Quality has statutory authority to look to the future under the National Environmental Policy Act and also to coordinate the activities of the various agencies of the government with respect to the environment gives them a very substantial voice without any concerns about their turf, because they don't have turf, to play the kind of role that's needed. Well, can I? Yeah, sure. I, I fully agree with the, the higher level concept of that. And, and it, it, what you said was you get the right person, right. you get the president to say, that person mm -hmm. speaking for me directly, and go for it. And whether it's a cabinet member or whether it's the head of the CEQ or whatever, or an energy czar, whatever, that's the way it gets done. Um, in another example, personal example, 
and the Makanda leak, the president comes up to me after cabinet meeting and says, Chu, go down there and help them stop the leak. My job was not worried about the Gulf of Mexico environment. My job was not to communicate what the administration was doing. My job was to help them technically stop the leak. And then you did. I was there. <laughs> but the amazing thing about this is then when you're, you're working or butting heads or whatever, and it really was working with BP, uh, they knew that the president was backing me. And, and if I lost my temper, you didn't do this, come on, let's get going. You've got, you've got to de-risk what you're doing. They, um, they said, OK. Uh, you know, and, and push came to shove. I go to Thad Allen and say, look, you know, you're the official communication line. This is what's going on. He would turn around and say, do it. You know, uh, well, good thing David Hayes left because he entered his answered his question, but not the way he wanted it answered. <laughs> because I think in his report, he was pushing that more responsibility should go to the agencies and less to the White House. That he was worried that White House, gets, White House staff has, gets too distracted and doesn't maintain the focus that they need, and that the expertise in implementation is particularly in the departments. Do you think he's wrong about that? Or There's what? an argument for that, yeah. but neither, uh, I don't think the Clinton administration nor the Obama administration would proceed that way. Both of them uh, use the cabinet, in my view, much more instrumentally mm -hmm. than to create policy or to delegate to them. They just didn't do it, and I, wouldn't, I somehow don't expect that uh, Hillary Clinton will do either. Okay. So I, I want to ask a different question, which is, uh, Let's assume the most likely scenario for the moment, which is that you get Hillary Clinton as president and you get uh, at least one or two houses that are Republican. So what's left is essentially executive action and orders. Was there, is there, what would be the executive action or order that you would recommend uh, would be the most important thing that was sort of left over from the Obama administration? Was there something that we didn't do uh, beyond the clean power plan or beyond some of the other executive actions that they took? Is there, what, what would be left that the president could do unilaterally without Congress approving? Well, let, let me start. Uh, uh, it was mentioned before, um, some of the uh, Treasury rulings uh, that uh, are part of an administration ruling, uh, one started, but there was resistance uh, when I was Secretary of Energy. The, the Treasury really didn't want uh, REITs to include renewable energy, you know, solar or wind. Mm -hmm. and, um, and finally, I actually had to appeal to the White House and say, come on, you know, this, this, is, this is an executive action. It, right. Unlike massive limited partnerships, it doesn't require legislation. Right. And, and so uh, something, if timber can be regarded as real estate, uh, and if a, a cell phone tower can be regarded as real estate, certainly a 25-year wind farm or 25-year solar farm can be regarded as real estate. And so that ruling is, I think it's being finalized, but they actually got so irritated, they say only the footings could be regarded as permanent real estate and not, not the turbine, the, the nautical, or, or the solar things, even though you, know, you, you supply them and it's a warranty for 25, 30 years. So, so th these are some of the things that actually uh, can require executive action. It doesn't require legislation. I hope the legislature re lets, you know, massive limited partnerships, uh, different tax code is beneficial. It's allowed in four sectors in the United States. It's called oil, gas, uh, coal, and gas pipelines. Mm -hmm. You can't have a massive limited partnership for a wind farm or a solar farm. That requires legislation. Uh, and can so, do it for biomass, though. Uh, yes, for timber. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's mostly for paper. It's, sorry, it's paper. So it's a crazy thing. And these are some of the subsidies that we have on, on one side. You know, uh, the federal uh, gasoline tax, is that a subsidy? No, that was helped to maintain the, uh, the national highway system. Last time uh, it was raised, it's 19.3 or 4 cents a gallon, mm -hmm. uh, 1993. And the Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, don't have the courage to raise it one penny more. And so now what's maintaining the highways is going to be general funds. Now, is that, is that a subsidy of sorts? I think so. OK, there's scads of them. And that the, now, that one, you need Congress. But there's a things they can do to create pressure 
so Congress can do the right thing, just to make the highway tax self-sustaining for highways. Um, but you know, uh, So let's pick up the Congress piece for a second. Uh, it seems to me a key to making any movement is going to be addressing the problem of the red states that are having to get out of fossil energy. Uh, Sally and I have run a sophomore college and talked to the people uh, in Wyoming and places where they really are facing uh, serious economic consequences from this. Is there more that could be done to ease the transition in those areas so that you could start to build a broader coalition of support for a green? Because right now it seems to them that all the gains from the green technology, green economy will be on the two coasts, not in the center of the country. Is there more that could be done? And given the importance of the Senate and their overrepresentation, they, they really have to be taken as a serious political constraint. What could we do? The issue arose in connection with the acid rain title of the Clean Air Act, which very differentially disadvantaged West Virginia high sulfur coal, Illinois coal, and advantaged uh, Pitot River Basin coal, which was low sulfur. And we did some things. We committed to clean energy research. We committed to job retraining efforts, things of that sort. There's only so much you can do as you look at the secular tr trend that has, was already existing before acid rain and is certainly going apace in the United States simply to reduce the amount of, of workers in the coal industry. That's a consequence first of the fact that they went to a different kind of mining in the West that was less labor intensive, and secondly, that uh, we've just begun to use much less coal over the years. So I'd, I wouldn't hold out hope that you can transform the economies of those areas. We've had, we had a presentation, though, on how adapting a lot of their skills for various of the things that need doing, and you think that what Texas has done on the grid, which I've been very much involved with, is really fabulous. It's gotta be done in the rest of the country. We've got to find ways to transmit energy from where people are not to where they are. You know, that, that's really out. important. Yeah, and that, I think, that's something certainly Wyoming has wind that they would like to, so what, this permitting thing is really a serious problem. Is there anything that a president coming in without the support of the Congress can do with respect to working with the states on these permitting issues? Well, well yes, yeah. it goes specifically to something that we were trying to do and, and many of the agencies were uh, meeting under Nancy uh, Sutley's CQ to try to figure out how to do, but we got a little stalled. There are a tremendous authorities, federal authorities, already conferred by law on siting. But the average time between I want to build a line <coughs> between the shovel goes and the ground is 11 years. Mm -hmm. And 11 years means people don't even think about it anymore. It's like it's not in the time scale of my career. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I was trying to get this down to 30 months through great resistance. Uh, I still think it should be about 30 months. You can give all the players time to respond, time to get their opinions down, time to, to seek, you know, what's the wisest thing to do in hearing all the people involved. Mm -hmm. But, but the trans, long distance transmission where the renewables are cheapest and best to get them to the places where we need the electricity is one of the key things that we can do to bring low-cost energy faster and faster to the United States. You know, you know, Bruce, I wouldn't discount the possibility of getting some things done with Congress. When uh, the president met with his staff meeting uh, the day after the elections that uh, he referred to as a wipeout, I think, when the Republicans took the, the Senate, uh, and he said, actually, this could help us on at least a couple of our issues. One is trade, and the other is tax reform. I think there is a constituency, certainly among the Republicans, for tax reform, and while a lot of the things that a new president might not want to might want to do, they might not want to do. But that's the nature of every time we've gone into anything serious, where both sides decide, well, yeah, we're not satisfied with the status quo. It isn't like climate, where they don't even recognize the problem. Tax reform is something that uh, a lot of them already support. I would think that is an area with <coughs> a lot of attention. And to the extent that a carbon tax has any uh, conceivable possibility, it's always seemed to me that. Uh, in the midst of serious tax reform, one might look at all of the alternative revenue enhancement capabilities there are and conclude that some kind of tax, probably not called that, is among the least bad. Well, actually, I don't mind calling it a tax, and, and I'm ho the hope would be that the Republicans lead the charge on, on having a carbon tax, a clear path 
Uh, if you take uh, Rex Tillerson, the CEO of ExxonMobil, at face value, he's been calling for several years, get by 2030, uh, $60 a ton per, on carbon dioxide, by 2040, $80 a ton. If you get other relief in some other form of this thing, not everything, I mean, mercury still should be on the books as being bad in a particular mm -hmm. matter, but, but I think um, that the ability to have clear signals so business can plan ahead for the next 20, 30 years is something the United States really needs. So one last question, um, getting back to the states again, where I was talking about the red states, but let's talk about states like California that in a divided government situation could have a more of a leadership role, particularly in trying new things or exploring uh, you know, dealing with this issue of miscommunication of, uh, of what would be possible in terms of uh, green energy. Talk a little bit about what you think California's role has been in, uh, under Governor Brown. Is that useful? Is it helpful? Is, uh, how do you see it? California's role in the environment has been absolutely uh, terrific. Uh, California pioneered the air pollution controls, automobile efficiency standards, uh, reductions, standards. all sorts of appliance standards. So many of the things that the country has learned from, watched, experimented with here, they did some things. I remember proving they're, they're doing a requirement for a certain quota of, of electric cars, and that required an exemption from the Clean Air Act. Uh, our people said it isn't going to work. I signed off on it. I did it nine times for different <laughs> kinds of exemptions that they deserve the right to try. They've already demonstrated so much. I have to say one thing I hope the rest of the states do not do is copy our auction system where 85% of the money does not go from the climate auctions, does not go into addressing the climate problem. It goes into uh, fast trains and environmental justice. And if you ask uh, where the expenditures are that are gonna benefit the climate, I can't find them. Now maybe they will turn out to be there at some very distant point from fast trains, although the experience in Europe has not really, has not really borne that out, even in Germany, which looks like it, uh, it should be ideally configured for trains. The tra trips taken by train constitute, I think, a single digit number in right. total inner city travel. So that's, I think, an unfortunate direction. It looks like pork, I think, to, or will to a lot of people. So uh, but there are other ways to do it, a carbon tax. I'll, British Columbia, I think, is, is the experiment. Is there any opportunity that we haven't grabbed that we should? Well, I, um, it's, uh, there's a list, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, just keeping time, I was going back to you know, California, the states have always, the cities and states have always led the country in, in, in doing experiments. And, Typically, the federal government follows after that. So California is <coughs> leading the way, but there's many other states. If you look at, for, for example, renewable portfolio standards, which I think are still necessary to create a market draw for the next five, ten years, certainly five years. Um, if you look at the economies in the United States, so look at all the states and how big their economies are, about 78% of the U.S. economy has renewable portfolio standards. Texas is a red state, but a leader in clean energy, a leader in many respects, yeah. uh, a leader in market-based electricity, the transmission lines, all of these things. And so, so there are a number of red states that are actually leading the way as well, yeah. and they should be recognized for that. Yeah. Well, I think we've come to the end. Let's thank our speakers first.